welcome uh, this afternoon to the Institute of World Culture. Um, I have a few comments to make just for uh, our online audience as well as our in-person audience. So uh, just to inform people a little bit about who we are um, for people who haven't been here before. So the Institute's a nonprofit educational institute dedicated to lifelong learning and the promotion of universal brotherhood. We're located in Santa Barbara, California, but we also live stream most of our events to our YouTube channel, which is iwcinsantabarbara.org. My name is Donna Moore, and I'm going to be serving uh, as chair for today's event. Information regarding the Institute can be found on its website, which is worldculture.org, and uh, in its monthly newsletter. And uh, some examples of the newsletter can be found in the uh, back of the hall on the table. And you can also sign up to receive a copy via email or snail mail. For those of you here in Concord Hall, who don't know, you'll find restrooms uh, to, your la to your right, just around the corner, and, and water behind the screen on a, a bookshelf uh, if you'd like to have some water to drink. The 10 aims of the Institute are articulated in its Declaration of Interdependence and they provide a foundation for all institute programs. They're posted on the website and printed in the blue brochure on the back table. So our program today is actually in uh, honor of Earth Day, 2023. And uh, the title of the program is Healing Grounds, the Deep Roots of Regenerative Farming. And it's in pursuit of this year's theme, which is opening doors through nonviolence and magnanimity. Um, we found that aim seven, since we can only choose one, and all of them seem somehow relevant to almost everything, aim seven is particularly relevant to today's topic. And it is to investigate the imaginative use of the spiritual, mental, and material resources of the globe in the service of universal welfare. So our speaker today, we're very fortunate to have, is Professor Liz Carlisle. Uh, Liz is uh, an assistant professor in the Environmental Studies Program at UC Santa Barbara, where she teaches courses on food and farming. She was born and raised in Montana, where she got hooked on agriculture while working as an aide to organic farmer and U.S. Senator John Tester, which led her to a decade of research and writing collaboratives with farmers in her home state. She's written three books about regenerative farming and agroecology. Uh, one from 2015 is Lentil Underground. <laughs> I love that. Uh, in 2019, a, a co-authored book with Bob Quinn, Grain by Grain, and most recently, Healing Grounds, Climate, Justice, and the Deep Roots of Regenerative Farming. That's 2022. She's also a frequent contributor to both academic journals and popular, me popular media outlets, <coughs> excuse me, focusing on food and farm policy, incentivizing soil health practices, and supporting new entry farmers. She holds a PhD in geography from UC Berkeley, but very interestingly, she has her BA from Harvard in folklore and mythology. <laughs> so uh, we can only imagine that she's a good storyteller. <laughs> Prior to her career as a writer and an academic, however, 
<clears throat> she also spent several years touring rural America as a country singer. So we're very fortunate today uh, to have Liz, and this is what her book looks like. And for those of us who have a high regard for Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, she quotes, her, the introductory quote in her book is from, it's called The Honorable Harvest. So, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that generous introduction, Donna. And um, thank you so much, all of you, for welcoming me here to your community today. I, I have to say I feel a lot of soul in this room. I can feel that there have been many, many conversations in this building and through this organization over the years. So it's really an honor to, to join into this ongoing dialogue and all that you have already been visiting about um, for many, many years, as I understand it. Um, so truly a delight to be here today. Um, and you've heard a little bit about my background and how um, varied it has been already <laughs> in my relatively young life. Um, but I'll say just a little bit more about how I came to this topic um, that I'm going to speak about today. So my grandmother lost our family farm in the Dust Bowl. And she was an incredibly important person in my life. I was lucky to, to have her alive and with me um, up until the time I was 30. And it struck me that she was a very grounded and wise person and that the source of her deep wisdom was in many ways her very strong connection to land. And that had a lot to do with growing up in this very intimate relationship to land and having a livelihood and a daily life that was really interconnected with that prairie where she grew up. And I'm grateful that she was also really honest with me about what it was like when she lost that land and when the Dust Bowl happened and her family lost their home and their livelihood and their community was sort of torn asunder. And she understood that you know, the root cause of this had to do with her father overplowing that land, that he'd gotten bad instructions about um, how to farm, that they weren't properly caring for that land. And so, you know, that experience with my grandmother really planted a seed for me. I wanted to have that kind of land connection that she had. I wanted to someday become the old wise woman that she ultimately became. Um, and I also wanted to try to figure out how to fix that problem with improperly caring for land. Um, so the title of this book, Healing Grounds, in many ways I think reflects what I see as the kind of journey of my life is trying to move my family's legacy towards one of healing and away from one of extraction and disruption. And over the course of my life, um, layers have been added on to my understanding of what the problem was <laughs> and thus what the solutions needs to look like. So um, today, I guess I'm sharing sort of where I'm at in that journey of, of discernment and attempting to understand where I am in the world and <laughs> how to be part of uh, a healing journey and interconnection with um, everyone else that I share this earth experience with. So with that, um, We'll jump in here and we'll jump in um, with this question around soil, um, which is one that has really fascinated me as I think a lot of folks have learned a lot more about soil and its deep connection to ecosystems and climate in recent years. And I have particularly gotten very interested in the implications of, of taking soil health seriously. So, you know, here in Santa Barbara, through the Institute of World Cultures and all the conversations you all have been having, I'm sure that you are all intimately familiar with the climate problem and its many nuances. But just to kind of start us with fundamentals for a moment, one very simple way of thinking about climate change is that stuff that used to be underground, primarily carbon, has been released into the atmosphere, wreaking havoc on the climate through the greenhouse effect. And now when we talk about stuff that used to be underground, that's now polluting the atmosphere, we primarily think about the burning of fossil fuels and the urgent need to transition to a different energy system. 
And this, of course, is true. But burning fossil fuels isn't the only problem. Another means by which underground carbon gets volatilized into the atmosphere is agriculture. So as it's currently practiced, agriculture and food systems account for about a quarter to a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and a big chunk of these greenhouse gas emissions, this is the agriculture part you can see in this uh, pie chart, they come from deforestation and other types of land use change. So when forests are cleared to make way for soybean monocultures, cattle, or palm oil plantations, carbon that was once stored in these forests and their roots gets released into the atmosphere. But then even after land is cleared for agriculture, industrial farming methods continue to release carbon from soil into the atmosphere. And because these industrial methods typically leave soil bare for much of the year, while relying on synthetic fertilizer, they often lead to large emissions of nitrous oxide as well, as all that excess nitrogen escapes into the atmosphere. And then we've got another greenhouse gas to worry about because meanwhile, industrial methods of raising animals in confinement lead to significant methane emissions, both from the animals themselves and from large concentrations of their manure. So the good news is agriculture doesn't have to be practiced this way. All these agricultural greenhouse gas emissions I just told you about can be dramatically reduced. Deforestation can be halted. Animals don't have to be raised in confinement. And overuse of nitrogen fertilizer can be curtailed so that nitrous oxide isn't continually escaping into the atmosphere. There are all kinds of ways we can reduce emissions from food and agriculture. But what about all those agricultural lands that have already been mined of their soil carbon? Might some of that carbon be put back? So in other words, and this is really the question that's animated my research and writing career, can we transform agriculture from a carbon source to a carbon sink and from a climate problem to a climate solution? So this is the question that I've been working on for about the last dozen years or so as I've become part of a movement in the United States that has started calling itself regenerative agriculture. And if you go to a regenerative agriculture conference or field day like the one I'm showing images of here, you'll find farmers and scientists and often lots of other people like chefs, food manufacturers, talking about how to put carbon back into the soil. And you might see someone hold up two handfuls of soil, one that's dark brown and crumbly, and one that's kind of a pale tan and hard as a rock. And this, of course, is a before and after demo. And you're likely to hear about the techniques the farmer used to transform that lifeless hard pan on the left into that carbon-rich earth on the right. So some of these techniques you might hear about, you might hear about cover crops, which are planted not as food crops for people, but to feed the earth. So these are often planted in the winter, the off season, or maybe when someone's resting a bed that they normally use for a cash crop. And planting these crops to feed the soil builds up soil carbon, which in turn um, makes water um, infiltrate better and store better so it can improve resilience to drought and flood. So kind of a win-win potentially for the farm and for all these ecological properties and climate properties we care about. And then you might also hear about how people are using more diverse plants even in the rotation of the crops that they do harvest um, to add biodiversity, um, recycle nutrients, also, having more biodiversity means pests don't get super comfortable with just one family of crops and farmers can break up pest and disease cycles while also diversifying their income. You might also hear about how farmers are thinking differently about tillage. Um, and here I think back to my great grandfather and the mold board plow that he used out in western Nebraska, you know, and that technique that really did lead to the Dust Bowl. Um, now farmers are talking a lot about how to use less tillage and how to use implements that aren't quite so hard on the land when they do plow um, to break up weeds and to prepare the soil for planting. 
um, with a really big spectrum of some folks who do zero tillage completely and some folks who maybe do it less often or with um, less heavy equipment. And then, you know, finally, on farms with animals or maybe farms that borrow animals, um, you might hear about how people are thinking about how grazing can actually be a positive force for the soil rather than an extractive um, force on the land. Um, rotating animals through pastures in ways that mimic how native herbivores, like buffalo, for example, move across the land um, after they graze in one place, leaving it to grow back for quite a while before they come back. So initially, all these kinds of techniques and these field days that I was going to, you know, say a decade, 15 years ago, regenerative agriculture was an alternative movement. Um, the kind of thing you might hear about if you shopped at a co-op or majored in environmental studies or had a cousin who was taking over the family farm and determined to shake things up. But a few years ago, regenerative agriculture started getting a lot of attention beyond those kinds of circles. Uh, probably you can't read the fine print in the right hand corner there. I certainly can't. So I'll spell out the image credit a little bit larger here. So this is actually a marketing infographic from General Mills, um, one of many mass market food brands that have started investing in converting their supply chain to regenerative methods. A few years ago, they acquired Annie's Homegrown, and they've been making graham crackers and mac and cheese with regenerative organic wheat, actually some of which has grown on my friend Casey Bailey's farm in Montana. You can actually see Casey's name if you kind of squint and look at the uh, honey bunny grams there. <laughs> um, so this is one way in which regenerative agriculture is going mainstream. Another way is, is in the media. Um, this is something we definitely see here in Southern California. Um, major documentaries have brought the topic of regenerative agriculture to Hollywood, into celebrity culture. There's a bunch of celebrities featured in this movie, Kiss the Ground, and into the living rooms of viewers all over the world. I have to say, when I meet somebody out there um, in the public who asks me what I do and I say something about sustainable agriculture, regenerative, they often bring up one of these films. <laughs> so it's getting out there. And then also kind of more in my lane um, around research and policy, um, the IPCC put out a new special report on climate change in land in 2019. And this report laid out the key role of land use and agriculture both in current greenhouse gas emissions, but also in potential climate solutions. So for the policy crowd, for like the United Nations crowd, people who think a lot about climate, this was kind of a big moment for regenerative agriculture, getting those folks' attention. So for me, it kind of suddenly seemed like everybody was talking about agriculture as a key climate strategy, which is exciting because this is something I care a lot about, but not everyone was convinced. So on the one hand, a huge international team of scientists calculated that increasing soil carbon by four tenths of a percent each year could offset 20 to 35 percent of greenhouse gas emissions caused by human activity. So this is the four per mil study here on the left. And this led the French government and many others to launch this four per mil or four per 1,000 initiative which has been holding major international meetings ever since. Prince Charles got in on the action. It seemed like a really large coalition that thought, hey, if we increase soil carbon by four tenths of a percent all over the world, we could really take a serious bite out of greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time, there were commentaries in scientific journals with titles like Managing for Soil Carbon Sequestration. Let's get realistic. And the authors of this particular article pegged regenerative agriculture's carbon offset potential at no more than 5%, not even a quarter of the four per mil team's low end estimate. And then the real kicker for people watching this debate came with a blog published by the World Resources Institute in May 2020, quote, regenerative agriculture, good for soil health, but limited potential to mitigate climate change. So this all left me wondering, how much of a climate solution is regenerative agriculture, really? 
So in 2020, in the depths of the coronavirus pandemic, I spent some quality time on Zoom with four regenerative agriculture leaders. Well, honestly, mostly on the phone because we were all pretty Zoomed out at that point. <laughs> But in any case, I had the immense privilege of being in conversation with four regenerative agriculture leaders who helped me answer this question that had been nagging at me about whether regenerative agriculture truly could make a significant dent in the climate problem. These four leaders showed me that indeed, regenerative agriculture can be an incredibly powerful climate solution, but only if we approach it in the right way. So first, I met Latrice Tatsy, a soil ecologist from Blackfeet Nation in Northwest Montana, whose research focuses on the carbon sequestration potential of regenerative grazing. Like many regenerative grazing experts I've met, Latrice is a cattle producer who advocates for rotating livestock through pastures in patterns that mimic the movements of native herbivores so as to regenerate vegetation and ultimately soil carbon. But for Latrice, native herbivores are more than just a theoretical model. Bison, or ini, as Latrice's people call them, are considered relatives and are central to the economy, diets, cultural and spiritual traditions of the Blackfeet people, as they are for many people indigenous to the North American prairie. So Latrice isn't just using historical bison grazing as a model. She's part of an effort to restore bison on the North American landscape, and not just within the contemporary Blackfeet reservation established by the US government, but throughout the historical territory of both her people and these native herbivores with whom they are so closely connected. Latrice can rattle off a whole host of reasons why bison are needed to fully restore carbon-rich prairies. By grazing selectively, bison create a diverse mosaic of vegetation across the prairie, which in turn supplies habitat for other species, including butterflies and endangered birds. Historically, when bison journeyed long distances, Recently foraged vegetation had time to regrow before the animals came back. And to adapt to grazing pressure from the massive herbivores, prairie plants evolved to apportion a great deal of their efforts underground to support their extensive root systems. These root systems, in turn, delivered carbon into the soil, where it could be bound up in minerals and stored for eons. Over the millennia, Bison helped build up the North American prairie into some of the most carbon-rich earth in the world. But more fundamentally, Latrice explains, bison are not only a keystone species, but a teacher. Throughout their long evolutionary history on the prairie, they have learned to live in balance with their environment, and their movements and grazing behavior are a lesson for anyone who is willing to learn. Historically, Latrice's people heeded this lesson and amplified the bison's regenerative impact on the prairie by setting carefully timed fires. And now, Latrice is studying bison grazing as a model for regenerative grazing of cattle. Going forward, she hopes bison will be heeded for the even more profound lessons they have to teach about how to thrive on what is seasonally available, how to build a livelihood matched to the landscape. I love these pictures she sent me of doing some of this soils field work with her kids as she was working on her master's degree. I also got to know Olivia Watkins, who farms mushrooms within a patch of forest in North Carolina that her family has managed for more than 130 years. When Olivia's great great uncle bought the place in 1890, he became one of the first black landowners in the area. In the midst of rampant racial discrimination and outright racial violence, during a century when 98% of black landowners were forcibly dispossessed of their land, the forest plot was a place of relative sanctuary for Olivia's ancestors, who initially lived off the land. 
Now, as the research triangle area of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill is rapidly urbanizing, Olivia's land is one of the few pockets of diverse natural forest remaining, and thus also a sanctuary for wildlife and soil carbon. For Olivia, forest farming and agroforestry are a means of conservation in at least two senses. As she conserves threatened forest, she's also conserving threatened Black-owned land. Closer to home in California, I met Ibe Guzman, an ecologist conducting a first-of-its-kind study with immigrant farmers in California's Central Valley. As Guzman explained to me, in order to effectively sequester and store carbon, soils need to have a diverse and vibrant microbial community. And in order to have biodiversity below ground, you need biodiversity above ground in the plant community. Or so scientists believe, based mostly on research conducted in natural areas like forests. The question isn't actually very well studied in agricultural landscapes in the US, Guzman explained to me, because in major agricultural regions like California's Central Valley, there's not a lot of agricultural biodiversity to study. But Guzman knew there were hidden hotspots of biodiversity amidst the monocultures of almonds and grapes because she herself grew up in the Central Valley, the daughter of farm workers who immigrated from their family's diversified small farm in Mexico. She knew there were many families like hers, families with deep cultural traditions of growing multiple crops in diverse mixtures or polycultures, families who were farming this way on whatever patches of earth they could find. Using satellite maps and driving for hours down country roads, Guzman identified dozens of small farmers who agreed to participate in her study, comparing polycultures to monocultures. The polycultures, Guzman found, provided much better habitat for specialist native bees. And importantly, the soil samples Guzman analyzed from these polyculture farms also had two times as many types of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, an indicator of that critical below ground biodiversity that is so important for carbon sequestration and other ecosystem services provided by soil. Growing up in the Central Valley, Guzman told me, she heard a lot of narratives about immigrants, not all of them positive. But as her data clearly show, the Mexican, Central American, and Southeast Asian farmers with whom she partnered on her research are literally bringing Central Valley soils back to life. And then just down the road from the little town of Firebaugh, California, where Ibe Guzman grew up, I met Mikiko Masamoto, who cultivates 80 acres of peaches, nectarines, apricots, and raisin grapes, the third generation to steward her family's Del Rey, California farm. Mikiko's grandparents bought the land and planted the first trees. Her dad, Moss, converted the farm to certified organic production some 30 years ago. Walking this same land as those who came before her, Nikiko thinks a lot about her ancestors. Without that generational connection, Nikiko says, much of the soil building work on her family's land might never have happened. When her dad decided to come back to the farm in the 70s, they planted trees her grandfather wouldn't have been able to tend on his own. And when she returned three decades later, the horizon for investing in the land expanded again. There is a gift of that, Nikiko says, which is thinking of my life in a lineage that is much more important than my own individual life. So many of the methods that develop soil take time. The horizon is long. When you're wanting to leave a farm to several generations in the future, you have a vested interest in taking up those practices. But digging into her family's history is also a painful and complicated process. Discriminated against as immigrants, Nikiko's great-grandparents never owned the land they worked. 
what little savings they had built up was lost during Japanese American internment when some 120,000 people, most of them US citizens, were incarcerated for years simply because of their Japanese descent. So Nikiko's grandparents had to start from scratch, eking out a living on marginal land as they gradually built up the soil. We are the ones that the world needs in this climate crisis, Nikiko says, referring not just to Japanese Americans, but also to other communities of color who have experienced oppression. Because we have those stories, we have that sense of fighting against the impossible. Speaking to these four regenerative agriculture leaders filled me with hope. Each one of them laid out a powerful vision for how regenerative agriculture could significantly address climate change. And they were already putting these plans into action, restoring prairies, conserving forests, and demonstrating the benefits of planting polycultures and cycling nutrients. But they also made me think differently about what regenerative agriculture is and what it needs to be in order to truly address climate change and shift the destructive course of agricultural business as usual. So the first key lesson I learned from the regenerative agriculture leaders I spoke to for this research is that regenerative agriculture is not new. Yes, strategies like cover cropping and regenerative grazing may be new ideas to many U.S. farmers who've often been taught, like my great-grandfather, that soil fertility comes out of a package and monocultures are more efficient. But this industrial approach to farming is really only about 75, 100 years old, just a minor blip in the long history of human land management. Meanwhile, indigenous food systems have employed what we now term regenerative practices for thousands of years. For example, on this continent, indigenous people have long understood the regenerative relationship among prairies, grazing, and fire. The African continent has a long history of agroforestry, a practice that continues throughout the African diaspora. As Soul Fire Farm co-founder Leah Penniman notes, Ghanaian farmers have developed numerous polycultures of trees and row crops, as have the House of Farmers of Nigeria, who utilize at least 156 systematic crop combinations. On the African savanna, farmers protect a number of valued tree species, planting their crops around them rather than cutting them down. And in the tropics, African, African farmers intercrop vegetables, grains, and trees in multiple layers, creating a multi-tiered canopy structure that mimics natural forest cover and buffers the soil from heavy rainfall that could otherwise cause erosion. As geographers Judith Carney and Richard Razumov put it, these farmers have, quote, transformed a rainforest into a food forest. Polycultures are also a staple of indigenous food systems in Latin America, particularly the Three Sisters trio of corn, beans, and squash that spread throughout what scholar Devin Pena terms the indigenous corn belt long before European contact. And if you've ever wondered where organic farmers got the idea for their nutrient cycling practices, composting, mulching, and planting cover crops, one of the primary answers to that question is Asia. So when University of Wisconsin soil physicist Franklin Hiram King took a nine month tour of Asian farms in 1909, he was struck by the absence of mineral fertilizers, which most of his university colleagues considered essential. Instead, King observed, the farmers he met in Japan, Korea, and China, home to the first recorded use of cover crops, quote, returned to their fields every form of waste which can replace plant food removed by the crops with an almost religious fidelity. These nations, King wrote in his classic book, Farmers of 40 Centuries, have demonstrated a grasp of essentials and of fundamental principles which may well cause Western nations to pause and reflect. King died young 
And while his wife eventually managed to publish his book posthumously, it didn't immediately take off. But in the meantime, not long after King's trip to East Asia, the British government sent botanist Sir Albert Howard to India, which was then a British colony. Howard was supposed to teach modern scientific techniques to Indian farmers. Instead of teaching, however, Howard and his wife, Gabrielle Maffe, also a botanist, found themselves learning. Like King, Howard and Maffe were struck by the high level of fertility on the farms they visited, farms with no history of applying either chemicals or minerals. Howard was particularly taken with the Indian farmer's system of composting, which he wrote up in English as the indoor composting process. The process and the philosophy behind it would form the core of Howard's An Agricultural Testament and The Soil and Health, books that have strongly influenced the organic farming movements in both England and the US. So these are just a few examples among many I came across in the course of my research. And the key point when we're thinking about the regenerative agriculture movement in the US is this. Regenerative agriculture is rooted in the ancestral knowledge of communities of color. It is essential to recognize, credit, and take leadership from peoples indigenous to this continent, Turtle Island, not just those who've tended prairies, but also those who've tended wild rice beds, the ahupua'a of Hawaii, the climate adaptive seeds of the desert Southwest, and all the other indigenous territories that make up the contemporary United States. And it's also essential to recognize, credit, and take leadership from regenerative agriculture leaders whose ancestors were indigenous to Africa, Mesoamerica, and Asia, each of these diverse communities have spent decades, sometimes centuries, on the front lines of extractive agriculture. Drawing on ancestral knowledge, they have honed the practice of regenerative agriculture as a means of survival and resistance. So a couple examples of that, you know, over these last couple hundred years. Arguably, the first U.S. scientist to reject industrial farming and call for regenerative organic approaches was Professor George Washington Carver, who began his illustrious career at Tuskegee University in 1897. Assessing the 10 acres set aside for his new experiment station, former plantation land that had been poorly farmed and suffered from devastating erosion, Carver quickly determined that it was in much the same condition as many of the soils farmed by sharecroppers and the few black landowners in the region. By necessity, his first experiment would be a demonstration of how to restore healthy soil on degraded land. Mulching and manuring with gusto, Carver poured organic matter into the tired earth, utilizing barnyard manure, plant residue, and soil building crops. By 1905, he had managed to curb the erosion and students began taking note of the dramatically transformed field. Although these methods weren't controversial in 1897, Carver's scientific colleagues began abandoning them in favor of newly developed mineral and chemical compounded fertilizers. But Carver was concerned that promoting fertilizer purchases would leave black sharecroppers in debt to white planters, undermining their chances for social and economic liberation. So he conducted path-breaking research on cover cropping, crop rotation, and compost, which he termed nature's choicest fertilizer. We know that commercial fertilizers will stimulate and for a while produce good results. Carver wrote in a 1911 letter to Tuskegee founder Booker T. Washington, but by and by a collapse will come as the soil will be reduced to practically clay and sand. And Carver's work built on an even deeper tradition of regenerative agriculture within the black community in the United States. When Africans were enslaved and transported to the Americas, many re-established indigenous African agroforestry practices in the form of dooryard gardens 
for daily subsistence. Braiding seeds into their hair before the brutal middle passage, Africans brought staple foods with them, intercropping them with indigenous American plants that they incorporated into their dense, multi-layered home gardens. Dooryard gardens were not only reservoirs of cultural survival and food security. As geographer Judith Carney points out, they were also, quote, islands of agrobiodiversity disrupting a sea of commodity monoculture, providing refuge to the non-humans displaced by the plantation system as well. These subsistence food forests, Carney writes, served as, quote, the botanical gardens of the Atlantic world's dispossessed. In Mexico, the indigenous scientist Ephraim Hernandez Zolokotzi actually founded the modern discipline of agroecology after finding himself on the front lines of the Green Revolution. So after studying economic botany at Cornell and Harvard as a young man, Zolokotzi returned home to Mexico in the late 1930s, preferring to work with farmers in his home country. He got his big break when he was offered a position with the newly formed Mexican Agricultural Program of the Rockefeller Foundation. The program was seeking genetic material for its corn breeding efforts, and it was Zolokotzi's job to collect as many varieties as he could find. As the young botanist crisscrossed the indigenous corn belt in the late 1940s and 50s, journeying across rural Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, he did indeed find the incredible diversity of corn genetics the Rockefeller Foundation was seeking. And yet, what most struck Zolokotzi wasn't the seeds, but rather the people who had been selecting and planting them for generations. The real treasure of rural Mexican agriculture, Zolokotzi realized, wasn't its genetic material, it was its people. The so-called Green Revolution that Rockefeller was pushing, Zolokotzi observed, was not useful to the majority of Mexican farmers. What good were, quote, improved seeds if they required chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and irrigation that peasants and indigenous people couldn't access? What good was a hybrid bread for the lowlands to a farmer living 5,000 feet above sea level? Zolokotzi became more and more dubious about the efforts his seed collection was supporting as he watched the saga of agricultural development play out. Wealthy farmers, using chemicals and irrigation subsidized by Rockefeller and the Mexican government, exploited Mexico's lowlands, churning out record-breaking yields. Prices fell and markets dramatically restructured, undercutting the very small farmers who had so generously shared their seeds with Zolokotzi, believing in his humanitarian mission. Zolokotzi watched in horror as these small farmers were squeezed out of their livelihoods, jeopardizing not only one of the world's greatest living archives of agricultural diversity, but millennia of knowledge about how to raise these plants in balance with their surroundings. The star recruit of the Mexican Agricultural Project started speaking out, speaking proudly about his indigenous Nahuatl heritage and questioning the doctrine that Mexico needed to be modernized. In 1978, he would co-host a landmark seminar agroecosystems with an emphasis on the study of traditional agricultural technology, where the contemporary field of agroecology was born. Interestingly, co-hosted with a very young ecologist at the time, born and raised in Santa Barbara, still in this county, Steve Gleesman. So again, these are just a few examples among many I came across in the course of my research. There are so many more stories about how communities of color have developed regenerative agriculture as a means of survival and resistance, and they are unfolding as we speak. In the context of climate change, these communities again find themselves on the front lines of extractive agriculture, which both deepens the climate problem and undermines climate resilience. But now, while frontline communities suffer first and foremost, the whole planet is ultimately in danger.
So when I say we need to take leadership from these communities that already know all about regenerative agriculture as a survival strategy, I see this as quite an urgent matter. So this brings me to the other key lesson I learned from talking with the regenerative agriculture leaders I told you about earlier, who, as you may have noticed, are all women of color. Let's be clear about why we have an extractive form of agriculture in the US today. Extraction is the playbook of colonization. <laughs> so all that soil carbon that was lost from US farmland over the past few centuries, It was cheerful, yes, I know. We're going to need a little bit of that to get us through this next section. So if we think about all that soil carbon that was lost from U.S. farmland over the past few centuries, that was part of a larger process of extraction, a process of stealing land, resources, and even people, a process of exporting wealth out of communities and concentrating it in the hands of a powerful elite. Nearly all 30 million bison in North America were killed over the course of the 19th century, most of them in a particularly bloody 20-year period. As land speculators in the U.S. military understood, their strategy of exterminating most of these animals would profoundly undermine the way of life that had supported the people of the plains for thousands of years. In place of the buffalo that had evolved with these grasslands, European-American ranchers imported cattle, which had been domesticated in ways that made human management easier, but also necessary. To accommodate the needs of their cows, these ranchers began modifying the landscape. They manipulated water, they grew feed, but most consequentially, they built fences, carving the West into discrete tracts of private property where forage could be assessed bought and sold as a capital asset. With federal coordination and financing, thousands of miles of fences were built, turning indigenous territory and open range into ranches. In a landscape where survival had long required mobility, life was now frozen in place. Simultaneously, indigenous people, those who had survived the military campaigns intended to kill them, were likewise rounded up and confined within the boundaries of reservations. The newly designated territories covered nearly a tiny fraction of these people's ancestral homelands, often places that were habitable only in particular seasons. They were told it was for their own good, their own protection, that they would be more productive in settlement than migration. In the early 20th century, these attempts to modernize both the people and the landscapes of the American West were so tightly intertwined that, quote, Indian affairs and range management were often overseen by the same officials. They sought to homogenize and standardize to make life legible so that it could be readily managed. They carved up interdependent communities into discrete individuals erecting literal barriers between formerly connected lives. And in place of self-determining groups, they sought to create what Chief Justice John Marshall termed domestic dependent nations, populations that could not survive on their own, but must submit to hierarchical control. Of course, this was not the only time lands would be taken. At the close of the Civil War, as the nation wrestled with how to incorporate nearly four million formerly enslaved people into the fabric of society, a group of black ministers approached Union General William T. Sherman. Their request, an allotment of 40 acres for each freed black family. The general agreed, issuing field order number 15, which would forever be remembered as the promise of 40 acres and a mule. But shortly thereafter, President Andrew Johnson rescinded the order. In the decades that followed, white Southerners would attempt to recreate both the economic and political conditions of slavery by any means necessary. 
Many southern states passed laws prohibiting black people from owning or even leasing property. Frequently, the only option available to black farmers was sharecropping, an exploitative system that was manipulated by white planters and merchants to keep black farmers in debt. When black families did manage to acquire land, they frequently faced severe discrimination and outright violence. More than 4,000 African Americans were lynched between 1877 and 1950, many of them landowners who were targeted for upsetting the racial hierarchy of white supremacy. Despite all this, black farmers kept gaining ground, literally, and by 1920, 925,000 of them owned the land they farmed. Then the financial racism started. The Great Depression devastated the agricultural sector in the U.S., spurring the first major federal programs to support farmers. But these programs, and critically, the low-interest loans they offered, were administered through local committees dominated by white planters whose worldviews had changed little since Reconstruction. Many black farmers were flatly denied the government loans to which they were entitled. Applications were thrown in the trash, unread, and black applicants would be kept waiting for hours while white constituents were served. When loans were provided to black applicants, they were smaller than those offered to white applicants with similarly sized farms. The result of this thinly veiled onslaught of financial racism was a tidal wave of foreclosures and tax sales, which ultimately proved more devastating to black land ownership than the violent mobs of the early 20th century. Between 1950 and 1975, half a million black farms went out of business, forfeiting a total of six million acres in the years between 1950 and 1969 alone. As journalist Van Newkirk has calculated, this pencils out to an average daily hemorrhage of 820 acres an area the size of New York's Central Park erased with each sunset. And despite the warnings of Efraim Hernandez Zolokotzi and his colleagues, the US and Mexican governments pressed forward with the Green Revolution in Mexico with devastating impacts on traditional farming systems. Whole families abandoned their rural villages. Agrobiodiversity declined. Formerly self-sufficient in corn, Mexico became a net importer of the staple grain by 1970. Food prices began to rise, and thousands of financially insecure farmers, like Aide Guzman's parents, sought work as farm laborers in the United States, where they were systematically denied full citizenship. Some one million small farmers would be uprooted by the disruptions associated with the first decade following NAFTA and the demise of ejidos, with devastating impacts for the plants and people left behind. In 2005, a researcher visited a rural village in southeastern Mexico, where an anthropologist had once recorded the biological diversity of local milpas. In 1960, the original study found as many as 32 different kinds of plants growing in a seven and a half acre plot. But by 2005, there were just eight. And this practice of exploiting displaced immigrants was not new, as in fact, waves of immigrants from Asia had had a similar experience. In late 19th and early 20th century California, the story repeated itself with one Asian immigrant community after another, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Punjabi. They came as farm workers. They hoped to become farmers but they were systematically denied access to citizenship and land ownership, ensuring that agribusiness would always have access to a pool of legally insecure laborers. So clearly, this is not a playbook for justice. <laughs> it's also not a playbook for ecological survival. Ecological survival requires reciprocal relationships between soil and plants, plants and animals, and ultimately between people and land. In talking with ecologists who specialize in regenerative agriculture, I've noticed a common refrain, roots 
Whether they study soil building cover crops or breed perennial grains or work to help ranchers optimize grading strategies, all of these ecologists are fundamentally after the same goal. How can we keep living roots in the ground all year round? Roots literally are carbon, and they also secrete a lot of carbon in the form of exudates that feed soil microbes. Carbon exuded by plant roots is nutritious and easy for microbes to digest. As a result, carbon from plant roots is five times more likely than above ground carbon to be stabilized as organic matter in soil. So a regenerative agriculture clearly must be a deeply rooted one. And yet, colonization and its extraction playbook have been uprooting both people and the plants they tend for hundreds of years. So how can the extractive processes of colonization be healed? How can we ensure that people are able to put down roots? So a brief recap before this, this final section here. We know that food and agriculture are currently responsible for a quarter to a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. We also know that implementing regenerative agriculture can potentially transform farming from a climate problem to a climate solution. But key word, potentially. <laughs> Regenerative agriculture techniques like agroforestry, regenerative grazing, and cover cropping are nothing new. They're rooted in the ancestral traditions of U.S. communities of color, where they find a much deeper and more transformative expression than a la carte technical approaches. And we've also learned that these communities have identified colonization and its extraction playbook as the root cause of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and they're working to fundamentally transform these relationships. But one of the most problematic legacies of colonization is a big impediment. 98% of US agricultural land is white owned. There's a new statistic out in Leah Penniman's new book, Black Earth Wisdom, which I highly recommend. Um, and it's a little closer to 95%. So there's been a little bit of progress since I wrote this book and made this slide deck. But still, the vast majority of agricultural land in the US is in fact white owned, much of it in the hands actually of corporate entities and institutional investors. And this isn't an accident. Indigenous people on this continent have been dispossessed of the vast majority of land in their territories. As we talked about, over the course of the 20th century, 98% of black agricultural landowners were dispossessed as well. And although slavery was abolished more than 150 years ago in the US, agricultural labor in this country is still largely performed by non-white people who are systematically denied full citizenship in US society and rarely have the opportunity to own land no matter how hard they work. So how on earth are any of these communities, people of color, supposed to practice the long-term strategies necessary to regenerate soil carbon? So one of the other wise women I had the privilege of speaking with as part of my research is Stephanie Morningstar. And she's the executive director, co-executive director of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about their work so she became the founding co-executive director in 2018. And in the short term, what this land trust aims to do is to negotiate equitable leases for farmers of color, vetting landowners to ensure that terms are fair and that the place and relationship provide what they call a safer space. Longer term, the trust aims to acquire at least 2,000 acres of land with the goal of providing affordable long-term leases to some 50 farmers of color who commit to regenerative agriculture covenants. Most importantly, Stephanie emphasizes, the land trust doesn't do anything without first consulting the indigenous communities who are the original stewards of the land. One of the primary tools Stephanie uses to work towards shared sovereignty 
is something called a cultural respect easement, which stipulates specific forms of indigenous access or indigenous informed management of land. So as a hypothetical example of such an easement, Stephanie explained that a Vermont landowner in Abenaki territory might have a number of ash trees on their property. The Abenaki, who make traditional baskets using ash trees, might negotiate an easement with the landowner who could agree to call a designated representative whenever an ash tree fell so that Abenaki could harvest it. Such easements could also grant access for hunting, harvesting, ceremony, reburial of ancestors, or simply be open to definition by the nation, Stephanie told me. The Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust is one of many organizations around the country advancing deep visions for land justice. Here in California, Mai Nguyen and Neil Thopper co-direct Minnow, an organization they founded in 2020 that focuses on preserving and securing California farmland for farmers of color and supporting indigenous land rematriation. Both Ivy Guzman and Akiko Masamoto are involved in similar efforts, working to advance indigenous sovereignty and ensure that immigrant farm workers in California have opportunities to become land owners. Latrice Tatsi is involved in efforts to bolster land sovereignty at Blackfeet Nation, not just within the boundaries of the current reservation, but also on the rest of her people's historical territory, which bison need to complete their migration patterns. And Olivia Watkins has become president of Black Farmer Fund, uh, which recently won the Humanitarian Award from the James Beard Foundation, which is building wealth for black farmers and food businesses, quote, to repair black communities' relationship to food and land. So ultimately, what I've learned from all these regenerative agriculture leaders is that Regenerative agriculture isn't just a menu of discrete practices that you can tally up into a sustainability score. It's a bold project to reshape our society's relationship with land and with each other. Over the past 500 years, agriculture on this continent has been a process of brutal extraction, and the scars are as present in our climate of racial injustice as they are in the gigatons of soil carbon lost to the atmosphere. Near the end of my interview with Stephanie Morningstar, I eventually asked her a very fundamental question. Just what is the climate crisis, really? She has a background in climate change research, so I figured she'd be the person to ask. Here's what she told me, quote, this is ancestor work. Everything that we're doing is ancestor work. Not just me, not just black folks, not just people of color, everybody. Climate change signals a profound imbalance rooted in the violent restructuring of relationships between people and land that lies at the very heart of this continent's history. This rupture disrupted the connections that make healthy functioning ecosystems possible including the connections that weave humans into the fabric of a place. That means the vital work of rebuilding soil carbon is inextricably woven together with the vital work of racial justice. <clears throat> what we are doing is we are healing our ancestral lineages, Stephanie clarified. It's about going back to the root issues, indigenous land dispossession and enslavement, how do we write those relationships between our own communities so that we can heal those things in this healing ground?" End quote. So healing the climate means healing land, I asked, trying to follow her train of thought. And healing land means healing colonization. That's it, she said. That's the work. Thank you. Uh, thank you thank very, you. very much. Um, you tied so many things together uh, that are very, very helpful. Um, 
I'm sure we have questions. Uh, thank you. When you ask a question, we want you to use the mic because we're streaming. So, so raise your hand or make it sound. And uh, um, hi, I have a question. Um, do you know if there's studies that show that regenerative farming can feed the world? Because I guess monoculturals will say we need to do this to be able to feed everybody. Yes, this is a great question around food security and regenerative organic approaches. And um, it's one that I get a lot, um, both from my students and um, in public conversations. Um, my very favorite study on this topic is um, publicly accessible. It's a journal article, it's a meta-analysis. So it's a group of scholars who looked at a lot of other studies and put them all together, which was difficult because these were all in different contexts. So they're methodologies literally for comparing apples to oranges <laughs> and it's hard to do. And I think this group of scholars did a really great job. So Panicio et al, 2014. The lead author is Lauren Panicio. How do you spell that? Yeah, Panicio is P-O-N-I-S-I-O. -I -I Lauren Panicio et al, 2014. Um, I forget the exact title in the journal, but if you look that up, you'll find it. It was really, really heavily cited and, and continues to be. Um, and what that team found was that it does matter how organic farms are managed. So many organic farms around the world at this point in our kind of journey in organic certification are managed using what a lot of folks call input substitution, which essentially means that um, the farms are not designed terribly different from um, a chemically managed farm, but the fertility and the pest management is supplied by biologically based inputs rather than synthetic chemicals. That is an improvement that is preventing toxic chemicals from getting into the water supply, harming farm workers, and um, destroying soil organisms. But it is not agroecology. <laughs> so agroecology and regenerative agriculture and all of these global indigenous approaches that we've been talking about today involve designing the farm system in ways that mimic the genius of the natural world such that you're not having to pour on a lot of pest control substances because you have so much biodiversity, you have the flowers that host the beneficial <laughs> organisms, you're not having to pour on the fertility because you are planting cover crops and you have perennials and you are renewing the soil organic matter through the very design of your farming system. So that's a very long way of saying that organic farms that are not managed with the full suite of tools here can have a yield gap as big as like 20%, which is a big deal. But farms that are managed with um, diversified farming systems, this team actually set a fairly low bar for agroecology. Um, they found there was only about an 8% yield gap between um, organic production and what you see on chemically managed conventional farms. Now that's on average. I think a lot of the folks that I've spoken with who are really, really skilled managers have essentially eliminated that yield gap on their operations. And a thing that I often mention um, as students are kind of wrestling with their commitment to the environmental movement and their commitment to food security is that about 40% of food in the food supply chain globally is wasted for different reasons actually in the global north and the global south. Um, under disinvestment in many rural and global southern communities leads to um, not enough refrigeration, not enough good transportation and storage. Um, and that's an issue in terms of wastage of food. In the global north, the issue has a lot more to do with supermarkets rejecting ugly produce, stuff rotting in our refrigerators. Um, so anyway, there's a huge opportunity to recover nutritious food in addressing that you know, 40% of food being wasted question. And then there's also about 50% of calories that are wasted in our confined animal feeding operation system. So we utilize these incredibly fertile lands, for example, in the Midwest, where my mom was born and raised. It's amazing mollusols, that's the soil type, um, where you, can, you could grow amazing food for people, but we mostly don't. <laughs> we grow grains for confined animals, and we grow industrial feedstock crops, and we grow fuel 
So there's also a huge opportunity to improve food security by addressing that waste issue. So you look at that 40%, you look at that 50%, and then you're like, that's a bigger deal than this 8% over here. <laughs> and with improved management, we can do a lot even about that 8%. The other thing about um, conventional yields and food security is it really depends on your time horizon. If you're using an agricultural system that is undermining the environmental basis of its very existence, you have a food security problem coming up not too far down the line, especially in the context of climate change, um, because those systems are going to be even more fragile and vulnerable. We see this with like flooding in the Midwest over the last few years. The inattention to soil health leads to much, much worse flooding, not only on agricultural fields in the Midwest, but then that water flowing downstream and creating flood events for communities. So <laughs> I'll keep it there, but it is a really important conversation. Uh, just to follow up on that question, though, well, I wonder about scale. Mm. You know, like these studies I take it are not on these massive ag corporation industries. So like corn, wheat, soy, uh, has there been any attempt to try and figure out whether um, the uh, ecosystem would work on this large scale. Yeah, whether, um, whether the kind of ecological approach would work on that large scale. That's a really good question, too. Um, I've had the privilege of seeing some really fascinating agroecological operations at a number of scales just because of the different places I've lived and built community. So here in California, a lot of the farmers that I work with um, are fairly small scale mixed vegetable and food operations, some who also have animals. So I've seen a lot of um, you know, just how intensively people can raise food and restore ecosystems on that smaller scale, five acres, 10 acres, 15 acres, 20 acres. Um, but I mentioned, you know, at the very beginning of my talk, my friend Casey Bailey, who has a grain farm that's, I think, about 4,000 acres in Montana. Um, and so, you know, certainly to my students at UC Santa Barbara, that sounds like a really big farm and like, oh, that's probably, you know, bad news. <laughs> you know, that's like, that's the industrial corporate farm. The interesting thing about Montana, um, it's super arid and it doesn't have the irrigation infrastructure history that California does. Most of those grain farmers in Montana are actually farming without irrigation in a relatively dry area, which means that um, in order to make a living, you have to farm a larger area. Um, and so there are a lot of grain farms at that scale, a lot of farms larger than that, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 acres in Montana. But what Casey's able to do on 4,000 acres, he rotates through, um, you know, like double digit numbers of, um, you know, different kinds of dry land, grain and legume crops. Um, he does, uh, you know, wheat is kind of the commodity crop out there, but he's doing a lot of like older varieties of wheat, like Kamut, he's experimented with emmer, um, he's doing lentils, as you heard. <laughs> that was kind of my start, was learning about the whole farmer-led movement to start rotating lentils into grain crops in Montana. Um, buckwheat, flax, he's got pollinator borders. He brought livestock back to the farm, which means he's got perennials like alfalfa in the rotation, and he's experimenting with grazing down cover crops. So there are ways of moving towards more ecological management of those larger landscapes, and certainly you know, grain farming looks different than produce farming. Um, but all of that said, you know, there's no doubt that part of this transition involves more people directly involved in agriculture. Um, you know, we have these massive, massive um, tracts of land managed by very, we're asking a very small segment of our society <laughs> to do, you know, one of the most fundamental tasks um, in our lives as human beings. And that has consequences for all of us. So I do think that, um, you know, finding ways for people to have really positive relationships with land and for more of us to be engaged in various ways, whether it's our job or not, making it a better job for people. And I do think that if agriculture could be moved out of the sphere of racialized marginalization, that would go hand in hand with making the work good and joyful and rejuvenating for human beings. Um, so I do think that the scale 
when you look at kind of the average size of a farm around the country and how many people are managing you know these large tracts of land I think that is it that is a barrier as well for sure two-part question mm -hmm. one is we are in the time of safra right now mm -hmm. for the sugar cane mm -hmm. so you have you ever seen that no but you know what I'm talking about yeah how is what is your perspective, your view on that process? Because controversial in the United States is illegal in many states. Yeah. And if you do so, it's only by licensing yeah. permits. But in the Caribbean, it's still being performed. And that's right. the only way they do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it sounds brutal and awful. And it's not something I've ever researched directly. It's not something I've ever seen. But um, yeah, I appreciate you raising that. Do you know any more about it? No. What is it? Do you want to say some more about it? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know the term? How is, is safra? Do you know the term safra? Anybody? No. no. You can explain it better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly. Uh, safra is just harvesting, harvesting time. But the harvesting time for, uh, which is right now, January to May, uh, of uh, sugar cane. And sugar cane in Florida, we have that here. Uh, the way they, the process is, the harvest, the sugar cane, is by burning the whole field. It's beautiful, though. If you don't ever see it in the south, it's gorgeous. It smells great, but there is a lot of pollution. There's a lot of negative impact. But for the farmer and the workers, it's the easiest, more economical way. So you probably know more than I do about it, the economical impact and the environmental impact and things like that. But that's what it is. Uh, they burn the fields of sugar cane. It's really difficult to harvest any other way. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Thank you so much for these really remarkable ideas. Um, one of the threads you brought up that we really enjoyed was the idea that um, regenerative farming could make a difference to climate change if we did it in the right way. Mm. And then you mentioned something about bison and the American Indians seeing them as their relatives mm. and mycorrhizal systems and that these are living organisms we can't see, but they're sensitive to oppression mm. and sustain pretty much everything that we do. And then lastly, the idea that you mentioned was that it's all bigger than me that we're part of it, but it's bigger than that. Now, um, Donna mentioned that you had studied mythology, and we're wondering if you might be able to put some mythology together with all this as a means of helping all of us rediscover our relation with the land. Mm. I used to think that food came from Vons and they made it in a factory. <laughs> so we're starting at a fairly low level, but we do want to learn. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do think that stories are really important. You know, it's interesting. Um, when I was in high school, you know, they had kind of just come up with this acronym of STEM. And I happened to be proficient at mathematics. And the excitement of the adults around me of potentially recruiting another woman in STEM was like very palpable, you know, the sense of like there's a particular way of knowing, a uh, quantitative way of knowing that is really highly valued in our culture, at least pieces of our culture. Um, and so as I have always been drawn to narrative, um, especially early in my career, there were moments when I found it being judged as kind of the softer side of this field, you know, um, and felt that push is like, well, I should really maybe go stronger into the science because that's where the rubber meets the road, you know. Um, but I endure in my belief that the guiding stories in our culture, which we have the opportunity to continue to evolve and shift every single day, are really important in directing the way that we engage with each other and the way that we engage with the land. And I do think that that's the key fulcrum here, that um, you know, the most genius regenerative farmers I've met, their techniques and their practices are really cool. <laughs> and they're very skilled. And it's neat to nerd out with people about what they're doing with their worm compost or whatever. But at the heart of it is their why. 
why did they dedicate themselves to being land stewards in a society where those are not the incentives? And so I think it's those guiding stories that remind us about what we're here for, what gives us purpose and meaning in life, what connects us to each other. That's the kind of shift that I think we all need to make in order to, as a culture, as a society, actually prioritize this land care so that people don't have to push against all of the social incentive systems in order to be able to do it. So yes, I think that folklore, mythology, story, conversation, dialogue is such a powerful means of change and creating the world we want. Uh, yes, I, I'm originally from New Mexico and I had worked with uh, an, a company that provided microbes that feed on toxins mm. and can rapidly cleanse and recharge the uh, microbial content in the soil. And so in southern New Mexico, they, they have a lot of chili farms and cotton and pecan. And where they started applying these microbes, the more toxic the soil, the faster it worked because this was a food source for the mm -hmm. microbes. Mm -hmm. And then they would regenerate it into beneficial microbes into the soil. So it was not unusual for most of the farmers to increase their yield by 50% the first year, especially the cotton farmers, mm, mm. and thereby um, within the three-year period become certified organic, but those are monocrop farmers, you know, and it's hard to get them to shift, but if we can train them to say, well, you're going to make more money using beneficial microbes and eliminating the toxicity from the soil but you're gonna get even more productivity if you diversify. Now playing the same one he plays. Jonah oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was another question. Uh, so I guess my position is getting the farmers off their chemical dependency is step one, mm -hmm. and then helping them make the shift to even more uh, sophisticated approaches that are far more productive like John Chester and Molly Chester have done with The Biggest Little Farm, um, they're a model now for uh, regenerative diversification. And I might mention that uh, they're gonna, Disney is about to do a, a TV series on The Biggest Little Farm. Uh, should be starting in the next couple of months, so. Nice, yeah, that has definitely captured the imagination of many. <laughs> Yeah, and I think you're right. You know, I, I do think that the organic movement has had a lot of really profound insights. One of them being, if we focus on eliminating these toxins from agriculture, that is going to force us to think about how to use biological and ecological methods. And I still think that's a really profound insight. And, and also, of course, linked to the fact Silent Spring was published, right? A lot of folks in the early organic movement they were concerned about toxins because of what toxins do to planet and community and all those things. I think that's also really important. But I think also you're right, this sort of progression of, okay, if we eliminate the toxins, then how do we accomplish the things we were using, the pesticides and the fertilizers? Transition yeah. To yeah, but I do think, you know, so much focus has been on how to change farmers' practices. And I think, you know, what I have seen in talking to a lot of farmers, traveling a lot in rural places, um, trying to come from a place of empathy and listening is that a lot of farmers are super boxed in by the kind of structural situation and the economic situation. And so I guess that's why I'm doing what I'm doing is sort of thinking about, well, how do we rally and organize as the non-farming majority <laughs> to support as a society the kind of shifting of incentives, the resources people need to transition, all those kinds of things. Um, yeah, because I have seen people do it on the backs of like, you know, small family businesses and fund these kinds of transitions. But then I look at that and I'm like, wow, we could, if we all pitched in, this would be so much easier. 
Um, yeah, that actually kind of presages the question I have about this cattle industry is so tough. Um, you know, your examples of how 40% of the food or land is used in order to produce food that goes to the cattle. The huge slaughter of bison in such a short period of time was such a travesty, and um, we know how much cattle has taken over the land. And there's been studies showing like how health is harmed by eating meat, especially when cooked in certain ways, and the people starving and things like that. So we're wondering um, how, like what, what do we need? Do we need better media to um, get out there these stories that appeal to reason? Um, do we need to advertise more in stories and movies and interviews about these great examples that you're giving us about regenerative farming? Um, or um, do we need basically education? Or is, is reason not going to work with these examples and different ways of showing what's happening because most people need to be convinced with a, a bottom line because of the economic factor or something else? Yeah, it's a good question with regard to kind of like, if you're looking at really serious problems in agriculture that are clearly needing change, concentrated animal feeding operations are a great place to look as like, wow, these have so many problems layered onto each other. You know, whether you care about animal welfare, you care about the welfare of workers whose jobs are more dangerous than even folks in the fossil fuel industry, or all the manure lagoons and what they're doing to the communities downstream, folks who have asthma because those um, molecules from manure lagoons actually volatilize and become particulate matter that people in the communities have to worry about, or yeah, the issue of the land use for the grain, like so many reasons why that is not the right way to approach animal <coughs> agriculture. I think the interesting thing, you know, again, that I'm sort of picking up over time is that I think there's actually a really large segment of the American public that supports a shift to the meat system. There's obviously, you know, some folks who are vegetarian, vegan, would love to see just like a totally meat-free food system. And there's also a lot of people who would love to see, um, you know, pasture-raised animals be the norm. Um, there's a lot of people who would love to see these large concentrated animal feeding operations regulated out of existence. But there's a very powerful big meat lobby. Um, and so I think this is one of these issues where that's where we're at, is it's not that the majority of the American public supports this group of you know, four corporations that own like, what is it, like 70 to 80 percent of meat packing. <laughs> it's not that the public thinks it should continue this way. It's that uh, my colleague Ricardo Salvador gave a talk in town like a month ago and he showed exactly how many billions of dollars these folks collectively spend on lobbying, but it's amazing. <laughs> so that's the challenge, I think. And I do have really good friends who are thinking about, you know, essentially the organizing challenge here is like, um, again, you know, Ricardo's phrase was like, either you're the money or you're the many. Um, how do we show up in front of these decision makers as the many and sort of outpower the money around this issue of continuing the status quo of concentrated animal feeding operations. There is a little bit of an opportunity right now because the Farm Bill is being reauthorized. That's the major piece of federal legislation that gets passed every like five to six years and authorizes all of the spending in food and agriculture, um, subsidies, traditional subsidies, but also some of these cool new programs like um, conservation stewardship program where you can apply to get cost share to do things like cover crop. So there's pieces of the farm bill that are propping up this concentrated animal feeding operation system. And there are like Heal Food Alliance is a great example of a coalition that's trying to push Congress and actually specifically President Biden to pass a farm bill that's transformative in nature. They don't believe Congress is going to do it, so they're trying to pressure President Biden to say, I won't sign it unless I see racial justice, climate action, justice for workers. They have um, seven priorities. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's an organizing challenge about how do we make sure that the views of the majority of the public actually are reflected in the policy of the country. Yeah. Uh, another follow-up to that question is, <laughs> Because you, you brought out uh, 
if you go into regenerative agriculture, that's going to take a big bite out of the chemical industry, right? Yep. So I imagine they're trying to maintain their status, and they have a lot of money. So you got the same kind of problem there, don't you? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, also the chemical industry as well as the meatpacking industry. industry. And the petroleum industry, yes, yes. The trifecta are all interested in preserving the kind of industrial ag status quo because that's their market. So, yeah, it is definitely, you know, we are joining with generations before us and generations after us in thinking about how to organize to have a food system that really meets the needs of people on the planet rather than this. It's just an incredibly concentrated sector. It's mind blowing um, how you really do have a handful of corporations that have a profit model around this. And um, yeah, they, they're they gonna go down kicking and screaming. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I'll ask a question that kind of builds off of this. General Mills, I was surprised to see them, and I guess I'm from the generation that uh, learns to be very skeptical when big corporations get involved, for example, the organic sector, right? Can you say a little bit more? Um, are companies like General Mills part of this trifecta or not? And can we trust them when they make these kinds of claims? So I'm comforted to know your friend is a part of it, but can you tell us a little bit more about how trustworthy those kind of marketing claims are? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's, you know, I definitely always look at the structure of an organization and think about how far down this regeneration road are they structurally prepared to get. And a corporation like General Mills is limited in how far down this road towards Latrice Tatsy and Stephanie Morningstar and Robin Wall Kimmerer they're gonna get, you know? Um, I think that corporate sustainability pledges have a, have a very limited ability to get us where we need to go on climate or environmental issues in general. Um, but at the same time, I don't think they're completely irrelevant. Um, and I think that I think about this transition as something that's happening over time in many stages. And I think that what General Mills is trying to do is relevant maybe to an early stage of that process for a certain number of people. Um, so I think, you know, the biggest danger of initiatives like this, there's a lot more food companies putting the word regenerative on the label, is if people think the problem is solved by buying that General Mills cereal that says regenerative, that's what I think a lot of my friends would call co-optation, that they've taken this word and they're doing something that doesn't fully get there, and then they're saying, we did regeneration. Um, but I think, um, I think it's useful that they have invested in helping a significant number of the wheat producers who grow for them to, um, in some cases, transition to organic, in some cases, grow cover crops, in some cases, implement reduced tillage. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm in kind of a tricky spot with all of this where I feel like that level of intervention is neither sufficient nor meaningless and harmful. <laughs> it's like, I think um, if it's possible for us as a culture to like acknowledge that that's a step and not pedestalize it and celebrate it too much. But that's difficult because a lot of these regenerative initiatives at food corporations actually live with the marketing department, not with the operations department. So I think um, it's challenging even for the people within General Mills who care a lot about this to get their supervisors to be willing to invest more of their bottom line and go beyond just the marketing piece of it. So yeah, I would say, I mean, to my students, sometimes my students are like, you know, should I go work at General Mills or should I go organize with Heal Food Alliance? And I'm like, organize with Heal Food Alliance, you know? Um, I don't think they're gonna be, you know, leading this movement, but I do think it's, it's a meaningful step and it's a kind of like, yeah, a piece of the short-term puzzle. Can I ask a question um, kind of along that line? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did, oh, you, have, did you want to follow up on your own question? Uh, uh, yes, I think uh, you've touched on so many little aspects. Uh, 
so many people live in cities. And one question, sort of the basic question, is what can people who live in cities, who don't know anything about agriculture particularly, uh, what can they do? And then more specifically, when you've mentioned reciprocity, mm -hmm. uh, why is it not possible to really increase the reciprocity between people that live in cities and people that do agriculture? Um, I know there's community-supported agriculture, and I think that's a good start, but that's not very systematic. Uh, if, for example, you can have an agropolitan district, mm. 50,000 people, for example, or something where there's much more of an intimate connection and reciprocity between uh, consumers and producers, if you will. Um, that would, and using land trusts, like you've mentioned already, which I think is critical to get out of the market, which concentrates power in just a few people, basically. Um, but you're going to need this real more dense reciprocity, it seems, to overcome the politics. And it can get pretty nasty when it comes to food, <laughs> when only four companies own 95% of everything. Uh, so you, um, do you have any thoughts about a vision for how urban and rural people can really much more connect on this? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's spot on that, um, you know, our society is rapidly urbanizing. A lot of folks live in urban areas and um, are, seeking, are seeking their land relationship there. Um, and so I think it's really important that we think about how to make those opportunities available to like literally every urban child <laughs> that they grow up with a relationship to land. And there's amazing research about how much that benefits kids' ability to learn, their mental health, their sense of themselves and their community. So even outside of hoping everybody has, you know, a place in these ecological tasks, even just our well-being as people is definitely served by having that connection to land. And I think there are so, so many genius programs out there and approaches. Um, as far as the urban-rural connection, I think one group that I really look to um, is Soul Fire Farm. I mentioned Leah Penniman maybe once or twice earlier today. Um, and she's a remarkable leader in the regenerative agriculture movement. Um, Soul Fire Farm is a remarkable model regenerative farm and also modeling a lot of really great education and programming. And she decided to do it while she was living, uh, I believe, in Albany. She was in an urban neighborhood. She was in um, a neighborhood impacted by food apartheid, um, you know, basically no access to fresh fruit. And she and her uh, partner were thinking about how, how to feed their kids. They had two young kids at the time. And they both had um, some farming background and a lot of curiosity about farming. And so they started raising their own food for their kids and their neighbors started to get really curious and you know they were giving various things to their neighbors and their neighbors were like, we should, we should like make this bigger. Um, and ultimately what they were able to do was purchase some rural land, um, which is now Soul Fire Farm. But because they were coming out of this urban community, the farm and its programs have always maintained a really intentional connection to that urban community in a lot of different ways. So like during COVID, um, folks from Soul Fire Farm went and helped urban folks in the Albany area to build raised beds in their front or backyards. Um, but also, you know, folks of all ages have come out to the farm and participated in various programs. Um, Soul Fire Farm does have, uh, they've changed it over the years. I think it's now totally free. Sometimes it's been sliding scale, but it's CSA program. Mm -hmm. um, but they have this like really intentional relationship with this particular urban area because the people themselves are connected to each other. So it is that like deep reciprocity in a sense that um, across these two communities, all flourishing is mutual. <laughs> so I think maybe it's also, um, as you said about like agropolitan districts, figuring out where those human ties exist or can be built so that it is more than that just kind of like one-off interaction. And also recognizing that people can grow a lot of food in this city um, and particularly food that's really high in micronutrients. So even if people aren't growing the majority of their calories, people can be growing a lot of fresh vegetables, herbs, um, 
culturally significant foods, when people have access to a community garden plot or a community farm or some room around where they live to do those things, there's also, again, like amazing research about how this supports our physical and mental health. So I do think that actually growing food in the city is, is actually a big piece of this transition around our land relationship. And certainly what Soul Fires Farms programs teach me is that you know, a lot of the urban folks who are involved in reciprocity with that rural farm have some amount of growing space themselves, even if it's not to the same scale as Soul Fire Farm itself. So I think making that growing opportunity available to people in the urban area at whatever scale. I mean, at UCSB, they're doing all this amazing work around container gardens for students living in Isla Vista. Even, even that like pot on your porch where you can grow basil or whatever I think is meaningful. It made me think about how um, in uh, communities all over the world, small communities, everyone has tomatoes and mm. everyone in pots or a small plot in the ground. Um, and whether they're in cities or not. Um, but I was wondering, um, I, I was looking at a video on regenerative agriculture and it was a, a couple of Australian um, sheep farmers who were raising merino wool. And uh, this one fellow at age 50 got a PhD. Do you know this example? He got his PhD in, um, regenerative farming because uh, he had had uh, a, a shock in his life and um, it, and to get involved in it he felt really isolated because it wasn't this was some years ago and he um, so he got the PhD to learn but also to give him some a bit of credibility and when he was uh, in the program, he interviewed about 80 farmers in uh, the, the south of Australia, I guess, where he, he is. And th his question was, what, what, what would it take to change your mind? He, he was surprised in some ways at the resistance because he'd had, uh, within a few years, able to turn dust bowl conditions into rich soil on his land. And uh, counter to something that kind of goes around in the um, ag world, big ag world, um, he, he, farmers on both sides of him had pest problems that he didn't have living right in the middle of it. Mm. Um, whereas it, it's kind of a popular thing for the ag people to say, well, it won't ever work because the fact that we use pesticides is, is our is protecting all these organic farms that are seemingly so successful. <laughs> Anyhow, he, he found in interviewing all these people at least 60% uh, changed to regenerative farming, not because they saw the wonderful results or anything like that, but because of some real uh, shock in their own life, some kind of earth-changing uh, thing had happened in their own personal lives. And um, he said the other, I can't remember exactly the rest of the other 50%, but um, some of that was um, people who had a, a natural inclination changed when they could see how things were going and that other people were doing it, made it easier for them to get on board. But anyhow, uh, uh, I was thinking in that line, uh, how, what you were mentioning about corporations being somewhat there and somewhat not, it seems one of the hidden aspects is that the constant lowering and wearing away of the organic standards. I was talking to a woman farmer in Summerlin the other day and, and she was raising doubts in my mind actually that uh, if it was organic, it, it might not be uh, non-GMO. and. You know, I went back and read the standards, and at least by the standards, that's not the case. But, you know, pesticides and things like that, I guess forcing nitrogen into the soil, um, these various things that I'm not familiar with at all. Um, but anyhow, it, all those kinds of things, I was thinking about the farm bill 
and how how things like maintaining a legitimate organic standard is is that a helpful thing is that something that people can do by their own choices because if you go and buy a lot of the things on the market that say they're organic you know they can't be totally organic or totally uh, healthy because of the price they're so cheap whereas if you go to a real organic farm <laughs> things are more expensive but the nutritional value in uh, in healthy really properly produced food really offsets I think the fact that we eat so much more because we're not getting the nutrition we need. So anyhow, I'm kind of putting those things together with how one can help. Is the farm bill helpful? Is it helpful that we have some input or through our purchasing choices? How can we help to make these things be more, have more power? Yeah, I, so I do think that getting engaged in the farm bill is tremendously helpful. And we do have this, you know, once every five or six years opportunity right now. And there are a lot of people that think this could be the year. Um, you know, some of my mentors who've been doing this policy work for, you know, 30, 35, 40 years, they've talked about a transformative farming bill every cycle. Um, and they haven't gotten one. <laughs> um, but they think they might get it this time around, even if they don't get everything they're looking for. Um, there's an unprecedented conversation about climate needing to be a piece of the farm bill this time around, with a lot more policy actors taking that seriously. Um, and I mean, one of the reasons why I continue to give talks like this is hoping that we take as deep an approach to tackling climate change in the farm bill as possible. I'm not as excited about just paying some folks in Iowa to do more no-till, <laughs> which would be the shallow level, you know? Um, I'm really excited about things like Cory Booker's Justice for Black Farmers Act, which would actually include land grants for returning generation black farmers. Um, that's a term that Leah Penniman and others use to honor the fact that they do in fact have farming and agrarian heritage that they're returning to. Um, anyway, so Cory Booker's Justice for Black Farmers Act is what we call a marker bill for the farm bill. The farm bill is an omnibus piece of legislation, meaning that a bunch of bills get put together in one great big package, and then it gets voted on on the House floor and the Senate floor as this big package. So in the lead up to the farm bill, a number of folks in the House and the Senate will propose these bills. They'll have a big party and they'll announce this bill, and their goal isn't to have it voted on and passed on its own. They're putting it out there as a marker bill in hopes of getting it included in the farm bill package. So Shelley Pingree from New England has a marker bill called the Agricultural Resilience Act, which would be the most fundamental kind of climate action and agriculture bill that would ever be passed. That's a marker bill for the Farm Bill. Justice for Black Farmers Act from Cory Booker is a marker bill. Um, there's another one around like local agricultural processing and regional food systems. So what opportunity is to tell Salud Carbajal or you know whoever your person in uh, the House is and also our senators that you'd like to see those particular marker bills included in the farm bill? So that's really powerful if you call one of those offices or if you write in through their web form. Um, and I do think we're not going to get where we need to go without policy. That's an essential piece of the change puzzle. But I do also think that our, our own food choices are important. And they're also a piece of this kind of like spiritual transition, right? Um, we're taking things into our body. And so even for me, you know, as I'm focused on policy and education, uh, my daily practices are part of orienting myself and reminding myself about how nourishing it is to be in interdependence. That's what feeds the advocacy work. So yeah, I mean, um, patronizing the folks at the farmer's market, getting to know them. I love the Isla Vista Food Co-op. I was actually taken there on my recruitment visit. It was a big part of deciding to come and be a professor here. I was like, hey, I can ride my bike here, I'm sold. Um, those things, yeah, it is different than buying um, the organic produce from a, you know, an earthbound or something. But the organic 
produce from the earthbound is significantly better than buying the conventional produce from the earthbound. So there is like a, a spectrum there. Um, you are still, I do still really believe in the fundamental integrity of the organic standard around prohibiting toxic chemicals and prohibiting GMOs. Those things I am really confident are being achieved through that standard. Um, the piece of the standard about soil health is a lot more qualitative. Inspectors go once a year and evaluate people's plans for building soil health. But that's hard to do through a certification system because it is so individual to each farm. It's, um, that is more a kind of person-to-person -person thing, I think, in terms of valuing soil health practices. It's hard to build into a national standard. So that does vary, I think, from the kind of large-scale, more corporate, cheap lettuce, organic, <laughs> to the what you'd find at the market. But, you know, whatever. If you're traveling across the country with your family and you're at a Walmart and you're faced with, like, organic, earthbound lettuce versus everything else, it's still better. Um, but I do think, yeah. The more, yeah, the more you can support people who are trying to do this, even in the face of incentives that aren't quite aligned, um, I think that's a great thing to do. Uh, one more question, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, thank you. Uh, I think you're aware, I believe that you're aware that there are some corporations that extracting carbon out of the air, especially carbon dioxide, and store it in the ground. Do you think this would help a little? Yeah, it's interesting. I wrote just the tiniest bit about this at the very beginning of this book, Healing Grounds. Um, so I, I, I wanted to learn a little bit more about it. And it's interesting because some of these technologies are actually called artificial trees. So I have this kind of, um, tongue-in-cheek follow of like, or you could use real trees. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm i really glad that researchers are exploring. You know, Dubai is investing a lot of uh, resources in the uh, technology. Yes, yes. I mean, there's a, uh, a lot of folks who are thinking about these um, mechanical ways of drawing down carbon through... Um, various things. One is called BEX, um, various ways of like using machinery to, to draw carbon out of the air. Um, I think it's really good to be doing research on these technologies, and I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. And in the meantime, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I just look at like, oh, yeah, you know, folks have been working with trees to do these things for thousands of years. So we we should definitely do the best we can to make the most of the knowledge that we already have about how to work with the ecosystems that we have evolved with. And I love how Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about us being like the younger siblings of, you know, the plants and the animals and the microbes. And so the more we can sort of learn from and work with our older siblings to do these things, um, since those are kind of tried and true proven strategies that also have a lot of co-benefits um, for our health and the vibrancy of our communities. That's definitely where I'm going to be most focused, but I do think it's good. I'm glad that there are researchers out there looking at a number of different ways to address climate, but I always have my eye on like who's harmed or like who's going to bear the cost and who's going to benefit, you know, and how does this also interface with economic structures? So those are the questions I'm always asking as I follow these news stories. <laughs> Why is it money? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, um, oh, yeah. I will just say thank you. You you all are amazing. You're here for two hours in the middle of a sunny Saturday. Uh, just so incredibly engaged, and this has been such a tremendous pleasure. Well, we want to give you a very big vote of thanks uh, on behalf of the Institute, all the people here, all the people who are online. It has been, uh, well, it has just been a wonderful I'd say for most of us, introduction to a very neglected area of our life. Think how we behave if we get a little bit hungry. <laughs> and yet, 
we pay no attention to where the food comes, just what time is the grocery store open. <laughs> so to learn so much, and fortunately this talk will be posted on our YouTube channel, and I think that we could spend hours uh, listening again. You offered ideas, you offered practical examples, um, and certainly it was a, a very interdisciplinary uh, approach um, from cultural issues to economic issues and very much down to earth in the soil um, <laughs> uh, perspectives. So you obviously have made this your life focus. Uh, you have a very unusual um, uh, set of, uh, you might say, activities and uh, research avenues that you've taken. Um, I'm sure we're all grateful that uh, we could listen to you with so much information, so much perspective, and most of all, so much heart quality mm -hmm. that you bring to uh, this topic. Um, we, uh, I'm sure we would, uh, could learn more from you if you'll return sometime for another visit. <laughs> and I think that we um, uh, know that this is not just um, a problem for a few, this is a global uh, challenge. And we here at the Institute are always keeping our eye as much as we can on the whole global issue and the idea that 40% of the food that's grown is wasted is, um, is horrifically and tragic. But you have helped us enormously uh, become better informed. And we hope that um, for our listeners online that you have, uh, uh, have, you've, you have benefited at all. So uh, again, welcome to the Institute of World Culture and a great big thank you for your uh, for what you've done for us. Mm -hmm.